So I'm Catherine Howe. I do lead healthcare uh, technology for Cisco Systems. So Silicon Valley native for the most part, and Cisco is right in the center of networking technology. And that has become a very important part, not only of hospitals, um, clinics, and uh, treatment centers, but also the human network. We're all connected uh, through our devices, our laptops, and I'm sure all of you have 2.3 devices with you today, whatever the current average is. So you're very familiar with that. I'm going to talk to you about um, technology in general and what's happening in terms of bringing innovation and disruption to industries. And then I'm going to narrow down specifically to the topic we've been discussing today, which is addiction and behavioral health. So first of all, it is true that every industry is being disrupted. And when we hear about industries being disrupted, we tend to hear about it in, I'll say, almost a negative way. Oh, Amazon's taking my business, or Uber's ruining the taxi business, right? Or Netflix, nobody pays for movies anymore. Airbnb, can you really trust those places? Um, but the fact is, these are all big disruptors that are the ankle biters of existing legacy industries we're all familiar with. And they came about because there was a need in those industries. There was a change that needed to happen, and the technology became available, and somebody innovated and created uh, something that moved right into that space. And quite honestly, that's kind of what we're hoping will happen in healthcare and behavioral health. So what tends to happen during the technology you know, booms where new things are coming out is that it leads to a population of people who are innovating around that technology. Think about blockchain, think about 5G. Um, then they find a way to do something that hasn't been done before, perhaps, or a better way, a faster way of doing something that has been done. And that's called disruption. And then there's folks looking for the opportunity to take that into a space that nobody seems to have noticed, that I could maybe use that technology in what I do every day. But wouldn't that be great if that technology could solve this problem in addiction treatment? So solutions start to come into the field of play, and then we look for funding and grants and ways to build those solutions. But the bridge really that needs to happen is between the innovators and the folks who integrate that innovation into a real value, and in our case, healthcare. Unless somebody here is about making the next Airbnb. Um, and then what we all want to happen in this cycle is we want all of that to lead to a greater set of data. So one of the great things about technology innovation and disruption is that we are able in a grand scale, a scale we've never seen before, to collect more and more data because most of these technology innovations are about connecting something that wasn't connected. And the minute, minute we can connect something that wasn't connected, we have a new source of data. So think about, um, think about the glass of water sitting in front of you. And one of the things we do in innovation is we say, if, if that glass of water, if we could make it talk, what would we want it to tell us, right? We might want it to tell us how long it's been sitting there how full it is, does it need to be refilled, is there a crack in it, right? And so this is how you start to then innovate and say, well, maybe there's a sensor. Maybe there's a new way of producing the glass or the product for the glass that can sense all of these things and answer those questions. And then suddenly we have glasses that are telling the waiters when to refill them and we're saving labor and we're being more efficient. And that's maybe a silly example, but when the price of that sensor in that glass comes down enough, that will happen. And that's kind of the yin and yang of what happens in, in innovation and technology. But true disruption, I want to um, just spend a minute on this because people sort of overuse this word about disruption. Everybody's getting disrupted, right? But a true disruption, I'm going to spend a minute telling you about this because I want you to be able to recognize when something really is a disruption so that you can, your brains, and I've never been in such a room filled with smart, such smart people, your brains can start thinking about some of the technologies out there as true disruptions and think about what they can, how they can be applied to what you do every day. So if something is a true disruptor, it tends to combine these three digital elements. And you can all read ahead on the slide, okay? But I want you to think about those words up there as digital. 
So they combine these three things, cost, experience, and platform. And when you look, think about those words, think about them in terms of digital. So cost isn't just price reduction. Cost is, you see some of the attributes here, price transparency, reverse auctions, um, frictionless. So the cost, the fundamental cost value proposition of the product or service changes. Right? And that means the value shift is there. One of the most important things about this pillar of the stool is that the consumer, or in our case, the patient, has a stake in the game. They get a piece of the action. It just doesn't work anymore to build something disruptive and not have the end user get part of it. Thank you, millennials. That's just the way it is. If you post a selfie in a fitting room, you better get some extra loyalty points. If you take a picture of the beautiful dessert at a restaurant, you better get a little something free for posting that on Facebook. That's how it works. And it's not self-serving. It is serving the business, too. We want that. So when you design something disruptive, you want that cost value to be, include the patient, in this case, so that they're driving the engine for adoption of whatever that disruptive thing is. The second piece that a true disruptor integrates is the platform. I'm sorry, the, the experience. So the experience is really about getting to a one-to-one -one personalized experience. This is where data becomes really important. It's one thing to get, be at Safeway and get a coupon for some offer on dog food, but when you're in the bread aisle, it's less effective than if you get that coupon when you're actually in the, the pet food aisle. Right? So contextual, one-to-one, -one, this involves location. So we start to say, well, where is this shopper? How can I detect where they are? Now that you know, maybe I've mastered getting the coupon to their mobile device, in the, because of their loyalty program, but I now need to incorporate the Wi-Fi system or the camera system to give me location detection and become even more personalized. So think about this with patients too. Where are they? Where do they want that information that you're giving them? Are they at home? Are they at the clinic? Are they in the lobby? Are they sitting in the car afraid to come in? That's really valuable information. And the last pillar is the platform. So the platform, again, think digital. This isn't a a hardware platform necessarily, it's, being, it's the digital platform. Whatever it is, get the digital platform in the hands of the patient or the consumer and they will start to tell you what they wanna do with it. So the attributes here are things like um, crowdsourcing, market sharing, peer-to-peer, -peer, the sharing economy. I don't know if that's a familiar concept. This idea, the sharing economy, is about how we each might have a little something that on its own isn't worth a whole lot, but when we can connect our little somethings, we can actually make a market. So think Airbnb. The only reason that exists is because you and I can post a picture of our property, we can take a payment, we can do a background check, we can do all sorts of things digitally because we have access to a platform that used to belong to Marriott and um, Intercontinental only, right? We weren't allowed in. Now digitally we're allowed in and we can start to do some things. So you'll see in technology as your patients are using things and as a consumer as you're using things, you're gonna do what you can. You're gonna push the limits of that platform when it's in your hand and that's a really important concept because we wanna be able to see what you are willing to do, how you want to use it and then we jump in as providers or retailers or banks or whoever, whatever business we're in and we say that's something we wanna, um, we wanna uh, encourage and accelerate and build around, right? Uber's a great example of that. Yes, Uber disrupted the transportation for hire business, but the minute we all started using Uber, we realized we had one of those little things that wasn't worth a lot maybe on its own, but maybe we could connect it somehow, and that was called the seat next to us that wasn't getting used. So we've paid for a ride, we're in the Uber, and the seat next to us is empty. Well, what if I was willing to share it with somebody and you were willing to share it, I could get a lower cost, so I'm in the game, there's something in it for me. The technology makes that kind of frictionless because now I don't have to worry that maybe you just got released from jail and you're hitching a ride to your next bank robbery in my Uber. I can check your Uber score and you can check mine and we can check our drivers. So there's now the one-to-one, -one, this personalization data that allows us to all feel comfortable. And what happens to the platform? Uber gets a new feature called Uber Pool. That looks pretty cool. People are starting to add people to the ride, and I see them handing money to each other. 
and double tip in the driver, maybe we can get a little cut of that and just call it a feature on Uber. So for, you know, fast forward, Uber Kinder, Uber Eats, Uber Medical, all these specialized types of Ubers because that's what people want to do with the platform. Okay, so I spent a minute on this because as we talk about the technologies coming on the scene, I want you to think about how disruption can really be adopted in the, the industry that you serve. So a couple of more examples. Most of us are familiar with Medtronic, leading designer and provider of the insulin pump. And we all know that the insulin pump has been modified to have a sensor, read your levels, tell you when you need to, uh, to inject. But you see a second sensor in this photo. So now a second sensor can actually take that information and send it to anywhere. So you send it to your device, send it to a cloud. And once it's in the cloud, that information can actually go to a contact center at Medtronic. So they can remotely monitor now. And so let's say the patient has been triggered and they don't inject. Medtronic can see that as an alert. You know, Steve Smith isn't responding to this. I'm gonna ping him. So Steve gets a little ping on his Apple phone or maybe his Apple watch. And Medtronic still doesn't see any response. So they can maybe assume Steve might be having a severe problem and unable to respond. They can actually deploy services, emergency services to his address of record and with permissions, he could override the pump and inject for him. So think about that. Now what happens? Emergency services come to Steve's house, they revive him, um, he's received an injection remotely from the contact center through the device. If he still ends up in the ER. They still take him to some facility where he is then uh, met with professionals that have to deal with that. And what you need to think about is what a new way to receive a patient this is. The first thing you want to know about Steve is how long was he out? What kind of a dosage did they give him from Medtronic? What were his vitals from the first responders? I need that data, right? And so how does a hospital now start connecting their network to the networks of the device manufacturers? Because that data needs to come in for them to be efficient. You can't have a world over here where this super amazing diabetic uh, treatment is going on with all this technology and then they go into the old ER and they wait and nobody knows what went on here. And Steve doesn't even know because he was comatose for about 10 minutes or so. So, right, so think about the implications of the innovation and adopting it and all the people in the journey path that have to also deal with this new innovation. And I know you all are thinking about some of the things in your own, um, your own segment of treatment with, that come into play here. This is a, another interesting example that um, really surfaces another piece of technology. This is called a digital twin project by Dassault Systems. And if you don't know Dassault, which you probably most people don't, um, it's a French company that was the very first inventor of computed, computer-aided design and manufacturing systems. So Dassault was the father of 3D rendering in the manufacturing world and revolutionized how we design and make products and manufacture them with CAD systems. CAD systems are available on your iPhone now. <laughs> so Dassault had to transform themselves, just like every industry. And Dassault decided to use their history as image rendering processing experts and they went to healthcare and said, what if we could use our expertise to render a fully functional 3D image of an organ? We could solve a problem that's forever haunted medicine, which is that you only get one shot at a surgical procedure. And wouldn't it be great if a doctor could actually practice on a 3D image, in this case of a heart, and the response that the image would have actually represents and mimics with very high accuracy what would happen in the real situation. Now you could test out therapies, you could test out clamps, certain things, you could test out uh, procedures. So think about this. This is not wide scale yet. Most hospitals do not have digital twins. But the processing, and the reason, let me start with the reason. The reason is because the processing is very intensive. This requires a graphic processing unit. Graphic processing units came from the video gaming industry. 
So NVIDIA, Silicon Valley company doing quite well in the market, uh, NVIDIA decided to transform and is making their graphic processing units for video games now available for other industries. So with graphic processing capability in a healthcare system and Dassault system software, you can take a small 2D, you don't even have to have a full image of a heart, a 2D image of a heart, send it through a machine learning tool that has seen millions of hearts, if not more. So imagine a system that has seen millions and millions of hearts, and you give it a little clip, and it says, oh, I'm now going to apply the machine learning of all that data to this, and I am going to render something with 99% accuracy based on the millions I have seen. This is probably what that heart looks like in 3D and how it responds. So think about babies that can't undergo multiple scans. You can't keep scanning because of exposure. Now you can take small little clips, not even full renderings, and fast forward on things. So this represents the power of not only the technology coming out, graphic processing unit, and some, somebody like Dassault with advanced systems, um, but just also the speed required, the data that's required, the sharing of data that's required. Who has a million images of hearts? The insurance companies. <laughs> and they're transforming. The cardiac departments, but they're siloed. They don't talk to each other. They almost kind of compete a little bit. So this represents the power of needing to share the data for the betterment of the whole industry, right, and to bring this kind of value. Sorry, wrong, but wrong button. So we talk about the applied technology areas now. And of course, um, this is a, a very high level of, of treatment phases, but the technologies that are out there today are being applied across the continuum of the behavioral health treatment from detection because there are some databases. We are building some capabilities around data and learning things. We've talked a lot about those today. The treatment itself, the engagement and the community, I'll put these together for aftercare and support and follow-on support. And a lot of these technologies are around the mobile device, around telehealth, but there's lots of other new stuff coming in. So we'll cover the basics. Everyone knows about telehealth. This is a video encounter. Telehealth is different than telemed. Telemedicine is the practice of, of doing medicine over video. So I show you a picture of a rash. A doctor at the other end says that's poison oak. Here's probably what you should um, put on it. That's a telemedicine encounter. Telehealth is much bigger. It's using that video connection to, yes, diagnose and treat, but also to go much further. And so you see some examples here of bringing in the family the support system can come into the telehealth visit to allow the connections to be made that are critical to the emotional stability and support of the patients. I have the twins there. Some of your patients are separated from their children for important reasons, but the connection can be made very effectively over video with a baby cam. They can have those visits and everyone can stay safe and they cannot feel shamed and punished and something's been taken from them. Something's been changed about the relationship with their baby, but they can still have a relationship with their baby over video. So think about the power of introducing that technology into a community that maybe has children and other, um, other things at risk like that. So this one is just an obvious one, mobile apps. I don't know if this is shocking to you, these numbers, but I was surprised to find that 30,000 of the 165,000 healthcare apps are for mental health. That's a pretty impressive thing. That doesn't happen accidentally. That happens because there was a void and a need and people started the first time one got introduced. It was probably very successful and it probably caught the attention of lots of others and then the development cycle began. And in fact, in 2018, there was published a top 10 list of the healthcare uh, mobile apps. How many of you have ever used one of these? Good amount. How many of you have patients who use them? Less. Um, your patients are going to use them, whether you tell them to or have 
you know, standard of care permission to tell them to or have the interest, they're going to use them because they work. They're working for a lot of people. Most of these top 10 are around calming anxiety, fears in the moment, dealing with a stressful situation, getting better sleep, changing mood. Mood is very, um, very, um, it's a very effective thing to change over a, a medium like an, an app through sound, through interaction, gamification, right? All of that can happen. So these are, are very successful. Some of them are just front ends to major um, resource pools. You see some that have 1,000 people at the other end of the app that can answer questions for you, or 150,000 trained listeners that can listen to your, right? So some of these are just front ends, but some of those apps truly are doing things that help with relaxation, sleep, and, and mood. So my message here is they're going, to, they're going to be used with or without you. I encourage you to use them. You're all doing that, so that's great. Um, continue. Continue to encourage the use of them. Med administration. This is something I thought was interesting for this group. And this happens to be a, um, a bandage, so a smart device that's a bandage. But there are lots of ways that we want to look at using technology for med administration and compliance and tracking. Um, so in this case, um, the, there's a photo under there with the sensor. Yeah, so the, the gold part is where there's the technology to dispense and the actual um, solution the medication that's being administered, and then the microprocessing is, is the other piece, and all that's encapsulated, encapsulated in this pretty bandage. So it can administer the medication, but it's two-way. It can also say, you know, is the wound at the right temperature, the right pH, is it healing properly, is, am I seeing bacteria? So though that kind of two-way information um, can happen. And this is important, why? Because we deal with patients who aren't able to take care of their own wounds. This seems so simple, who needs this? Right? But there are people who are going in and out of, of consciousness and the ability to change a bandage. Right? The bandage may just come off because they haven't taken a bath in a few days. So all of that uh, is this kind of technology can help that person go through those tough times and not die from sepsis. What a shame to have all your great treatment and therapy and intervention and then something like infection gets them because they couldn't take care of something that was very treatable. So the technologies um, are going to come into our population that we are serving because at certain times they do need all of these different things, even though they seem you know, somewhat basic or maybe that's good for children or what have you, but, but uh, they do need them. So wearables, certainly we're very familiar with wearables. Um, this is important because self-monitoring and self-accountability is the trend in healthcare. We are absolutely in a generation where we are pushing the accountability out to the patient to be compliant, to measure their own blood pressure, to do their own exercise, to get enough sleep, to hydrate, all of the things, their diet, all of that we are pushing more and more to them. And so self-monitoring devices are being adopted very heavily by the consumer. They're also then connecting, so think of a Medtronics patient, they're then connecting back to the provider environment. So when you walk in and you're you know, all tricked out with your self-monitoring, you've got a lot of data you're walking in with. So what does that mean for the, the doctor? So if the doctor used to get $150 for an office visit to take your blood pressure and your urine and your heart and look in your ear, and now you're gonna give them a little report on your phone that says, hey, it's all right here, I already bought the equipment, I can give you the data. There's a difference in that office visit now. This is disruptive, and the insurance companies are saying, well, how do we deal with this? Am I on? You're in charge of my time, sis. We're OK? Yeah. Oh, OK. I'm going to go a little more quickly than if I only have five. Because um, this one is an interesting device. This came out of Carnegie Mellon. The FDA actually so did a hackathon, and Carnegie Mellon came up with this device called the Hope Band which actually has um, LED light sensors that are going to stimulate the skin and allow the sensor to read oxygen level, which is one of the key indicators of an overdose. So this is a very simple band that reads oxygen levels and with a sensor at, and a threshold will send an alert to, um, to a community of people that are the support, the parents, whoever, for this individual who's at risk. So think about Medtronics, right? This is simply the alerting phase. Think if now you could override and have the Narcan um, be injected as well or administered. 
So that's interesting. Experiences without risks. Uh, augmented and virtual reality are coming on full strength in healthcare. So augmented reality scenarios let you go enter into a space um, to quote our panelists, <laughs> to create a space where you can actually simulate things and work on things like anxieties and fears. So you can actually go, if you have a fear of heights, you can go into a simulated environment and actually on your first meeting go up to the first floor in the elevator and by several sessions later you're on the 10th floor. You can even simulate jumping out of a window if you're afraid of heights in a very safe environment. And you can control that, you can control the landing, the parachute, all of the things to help the person feel comfortable getting through the exposure part of treating an anxiety like that. The other thing is virtual reality, so fully immersive, being an avatar. Okay, This is a really cool technology because one of the things that people with mental health issues and fears and anxieties, they their ability to separate themselves, look at themselves objectively, is distorted sometimes. And a avatar lets you actually create a version of yourself, that's what an avatar is, a version of yourself that comes on the scene and does the interaction and kind of role plays out the thing that you're trying to conquer. So let's say you're getting bullied at school. Right? And you could actually have your avatar show up at school with another avatar that looks like the bully and say, you're going to do it this time. You're going to stand up to that guy. Right? And you're gonna, your avatar is going to stand up to that person, and you're going to see the reaction. And maybe you get pushed and shoved down, whatever. It still happens. Let's get rid of these people. They're, they're bouncing around a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. But you could actually see yourself in that role and experience the strength and the confidence that comes with trying something. So behavioral health avatars, virtual reality programs, are definitely, we're seeing an increase of these in the market. Now, the roadblocks to this in the past, the technology. So it'll kill your battery in about five minutes, right? But now with 5G and with the graphic processing chips, you can see all the technology comes together to make these innovations come to life in the, the area that, that we're um, practicing it. Um, ingestibles, I won't go into this because, because <laughs> I have to get to the very last one, which is just to say that you are the bridge between the technology and the innovation really being adopted, and then we all have um, our inspirations. So hopefully, more solutions. Thank you. Or do you want to do Tom and then group questions or whatever you want? This was so informative and also training the new workforce with new technology is so crucial that I've checked with Dr. Mayo and we're going to take a, go move about 15 minutes into the next panel. The language used, and we try to integrate it to the conference, she said disruptive technology. If you go way back to how we began the day, psychedelics would be viewed as a disruptive technology to the addiction treatment field. So uh, it, again, the space-time continuum, there is an integrated component, the language being used, and what I'm going to do <clears throat> with uh, Dr. Allison Mayo's permission, and Steve has the microphone, is to entertain any questions from the field. But this is complicated stuff, so are there any questions? Any questions? Okay. Can I give you this? Is that okay? You're asking about virtual. Um, Who's creating that app for the virtual reality to have the role play and yeah, create the, avatars? There's a good, good question. There are a lot of them. A lot of companies are building. In fact, they're coming out of Hollywood and media to build these beautiful engagement and immersive environments. Then they run on computers. Okay, They will run on an iPad. 
but they will then, you know, the data and the connection and the security, all of that's where Cisco comes into. So we're back to the human network. How does it all get networked together for healthcare so it's secure, right, and accessible and all of that? So but what would I look up to find that app or that company? Augmented so or many. virtual reality in behavioral health. Google that and you'll come up with a few. It's an emerging area. Okay, so I would say Google it next week too. <laughs> You'll see a few more. We've got one over here. Uh, behavioral health has some pretty stringent uh, confidentiality laws. Yeah. Uh, I mean, have you over here? Sorry, over here. Ah. Um, have you thought about uh, ways of of accommodating those confidentiality laws and? and and what challenges might they pr present? Yeah, that's a, a, a very, you know, top of mind question. The confidentiality and HIPAA compliance and all of that. So we look at that privacy and security at various layers. So the very fundamental layer is the device itself. So if I am a patient and I buy an iPhone and I want to use an app or virtual reality experience, I want my phone to be HIPAA compliant. I don't want anybody to be able to hack my phone. And then the apps on there need to be secure. So this is where a company like Cisco comes in with the Apple and the designer of the app, and we make sure it's HIPAA compliant all the way through. So Apple devices are HIPAA compliant. Cisco Network and Security is HIPAA compliant. When that data then goes into the hospital or to your clinic and to your EHR that you're managing with the patient, that's the connection that also has to be secured. So now you're looking at threat defense, malware defense. That's, again, network security, and that's the domain of a Cisco kind of company. Yeah. Got another one over here. Thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, I really appreciate hearing it. Um, I'm concerned. Or could you tell us if there's any technology that you're concerned about that you would consider maybe unhealthy, mentally health-wise, that maybe... Um, disruptive to human connection. Like where, where, you know, you being an expert, where can we draw the line? What could be dangerous for us? I'm really glad you asked that question because it was something I was gonna, going to get to. The use of technology itself can form an addiction. And we all loosely talk about our kids being addicted to video games. But that is a very serious thing. There is, in China in particular, in the Asian countries. There are addictions to technology and there are medical practices starting around technology addiction. And it is really about the social media. It is really about checking uh, Facebook and Instagram and all of that every second of every day. There is a case in China where the parents took the daughter's Facebook account. They said, you must close it, we're done with it. No more Facebook account. And she unfortunately took her life. That's how real that addiction is. And so when does it go bad? Um, you know, this is, this is in your realm of the trade-offs. If you have somebody who is doing high-risk behaviors with needles and multiple substances, are you going to make that trade-off that maybe they get addicted to Calm or Mood Notes or one of these apps? You might want to make that trade-off. But there is also an addictive property to the technology. And that is a concern, nationwide, worldwide. 